Welcome to Living the New Life with Valentine Okeke. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So this morning I'm going to share briefly, very briefly about an issue that I believe in my heart that has been a source of confusion in Christendom. The Old Testament and the New Testament. The relationship between the two and how to appropriate the Word of God in both Testaments. You know the Old Testament it's referred as the law of Moses. If you recall in Exodus chapter 20, starting from verse 1 to 21, God started giving the children of Israel what we call the Ten Commandments. And as God spoke, the children of Israel cried out to Moses, so please tell God to stop speaking to us directly. Tell him that whatever he tells you, we will obey, we will gladly obey. Because if we continue to hear his voice, we are all going to die. That's about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, as it were, and other commandments and precepts, are to be obeyed. In other words, the Ten Commandments demands obedience. The commandments of God, it demands obedience. And those commandments are based on the Word of God to the children of Israel. And they are all summed up in one word called the law. So in other words, the law is based on the commandments of God. I want you to take note of that, it's very important. The law is based on the commandments of God. And they are to be obeyed. And Jesus Christ, when he was accused, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he said, I have not come to destroy the laws and the precepts. I have come to fulfill them. And hanging on the cross, in John chapter 19, verse 30, he said, it is finished. What was finished? That means all the requirements of the law. He said, I have fulfilled them this day and it is finished. As a believer, are we supposed to obey the commandments of God for us to be able to have relationship with God? Because I think that is the main question that has been bothering a lot of people. Is it that the laws have been set aside? Jesus Christ said that all the laws put together is summarized to us to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. That is the law of Christ. In other words, we have two laws. The law of Moses and the law of Christ. The law of Moses is based on the commandments of God. While the law of, the law of Christ is based on just one thing to love. And what it means to obey 
the law of Christ is to share each other's troubles and problems. That is the meaning of obeying the law of Christ. Now, for you to be able to operate the law of Christ, you must walk in faith. Because we are told that the just must live and walk by faith. And we are told in Romans chapter 10 verse 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But the most important thing about faith is that faith is based on the promises of God. The difference between the law and faith is that the law is based on the commandments of God while faith is based on the promises of God. The Old Testament is governed by the commandments of God while the New Testament is governed by faith, the promises of God. Commandments, by its nature, demands obedience. I'm trying to draw a line of distinction now. Commandment demands obedience. Promises demand believing. Promises demand believing. If I make a promise to you like I did now, that after the service you are entitled to have your lunch and a drink, it's a promise. It is either you believe it or you don't believe it. And if you don't believe it, you are simply calling me a liar. And God is not a man that he should lie. Has he said anything without doing it? Have you seen the main distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament? The Old is governed by laws. The New is governed by faith. And faith is based on the promises of God. So it's either you believe those promises or you don't believe it. And he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So when you walk in faith, you must be a believer in the promises of God. And that is why so many Christians are having confusion. They try to simply obey the promises of God. But you must first of all believe it. If God says it, that settles it. He said, I will never alter anything that goes out of my mouth. That is the key. When you come to terms with that fact that anything that comes out from the mouth of God will fulfill his purpose, then he helps you to trust him. It is only when you believe him that you can act on his promise. In summary, faith is simply acting on the promises of God that you believe. If I say now that there is a lion in this compound, it is either you believe me or you don't believe me. And if you believe me, I can assure you that not one single one of you will want to leave this auditorium. How many of you want to go out if I say that there is a lion that is loose in this compound? How many of you will want to go out? We will all stay here until we get the news that the lion had been killed or taken care of. True or false? 
Why did you decide to sit down behind? Because you believe what I said. When you act on what you believe, it is counted it as faith. And we are told that without faith, it is impossible to please God. What it simply means is that without your believing the promises of God, you will never be able to please God. And we are told that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That means that Abraham was able to establish a right standing with God simply by believing the promises that God gave to him. There was no law that God gave to Abraham. All God did was to make a promise to him and he accepted that promise. He believed that promise and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Today as a believer, our main challenge is for us to get to a point that will believe all the promises of God that it will come to pass. And one of such promises, he said, I will guide you along the best pathway of your life. He said, I will advise you and I will watch over you. He said that the rod of the wicked will never rest upon your lot. That the sun that he created, that the moon that he created will not harm you by day or by night. That I will bless your going out, I will bless your coming back. Because I have detailed my angels to follow you to bear you in their arms. The question this morning, how many of such promises of God do you know? How many of them have you accepted? How many of them are you working with in reality? God's mercy and peace will always be upon all who live by his principles because they are the new people of God. His mercy and peace will always rest upon those that live by His principles. Because the promises of God, they are governed by His principles. That is why it is important that we get to know the promises of God. Many of which are conditional. We have a part to play in it. God also has a part to play. Our choices as believers in life, they are bound by two great conflicts. One is the desire for us to satisfy our sinful nature. And the other one is for us to satisfy the Holy Spirit. That is why we are told in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that if we allow the Holy Spirit to control our lives, he said he will produce this kind of fruit in us, love, that expresses itself in joy, in peace, in patience, in kindness, in goodness, in faithfulness, in gentleness, and in self-control. If we allow the Holy Spirit to control our lives. And when the love of God is deposited in your heart, the Holy Spirit is the one that will help you to express. You will never be able to express the love of God until it is deposited in your heart. Likewise, the joy of the Lord if it's not in your heart, you will not be able to express it. The peace of the Lord, if it's not in your heart, you will not be able to express it. The patience of God, if it's not in your heart, you will not be able to express it. The same thing with kindness, the same thing with goodness, the same thing with faithfulness. You can never give what you don't have. Because Christ said that every 
seed will produce after its kind. And the computer language, they call it garbage in, garbage out. You can never give what you don't have. We must first of all accept the love of God in our individual lives before we can express it to one another. And that is where the tire meets the road. Because Jesus Christ, speaking to his disciples, he said that God's greatest desire is to see this fruit produced in the life of his children. That when this fruit is produced, then you can ask the Father whatever you want and he will gladly give it to you in my name. Who are the people that will receive from the Father? Is it the believers? No, it is those that produce the fruit. What fruit is he talking about? The fruit of love. After you read John chapter 15 verse 16, you will see it there. That those that can come to the Father and receive whatsoever they desire, in his name are those that produce the fruit. That means that without the fruit, there is no way you can receive from the Father. And to produce the fruit means to cultivate and develop the characteristics that made Jesus Christ exactly who he was when he was here on earth. Every believer have been called to live in freedom. Freedom to serve one another in love. Every believer have been called to live in freedom. Not freedom to behave anyhow, as is common in Christendom today. People behave anyhow, all in the name of being born again. But freedom to serve one another in love. That is why the whole law has been summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. The implication is that if you fail to heed this command, then watch out for destruction who will surely strike. You notice that many Christians today are having all kinds of uh, challenges simply because they've not heed to that one command to love one another as they love themselves. The message of prosperity is good. The message of divine healing is good. Which other message do you normally hear? What? Did they, ah, that was rampant in the 80s and 90s. Everybody had demonic spirit. To the extent that many people, simple mistakes, they believe that somebody is projecting something from the village. When actually, <laughs> you're just doing your own thing. Any accident is an attack. When you've refused to service your cars at Wendy, you refuse to change your tires, you see a child who go to school, he or she will not pay attention to the teacher. When that child fails the exam, it's an attack. Everything is an attack. You refuse to conduct your affairs the way you ought to. You refuse to learn basic business principles and your business collapses, it's an attack. It's a projection from the village. I was sharing with my wife this morning, my cousin that came and said, bros, you know these people have tied my hands and legs and just kept me. I said, is that so? They tied your hands, they tied your legs, why didn't they tie your mouth? He said, huh? I said, yes. If they had tied your mouth, you wouldn't have the mouth to be telling me this rubbish now. He came to borrow money to pay house rent. I said, if you cannot pay house rent, 
then you don't have any business living in the township. Go back to the village where we have many houses that are empty and free and go and live there. Then the other one came to me. He said that he's been under severe attack. I said, what happened? That uh, the wife put to bed and the doctors have seized both the wife and the child. I said, is that so? He said, yes. I said, if he has seized them, why are you bothered? Are they feeding them? He said, yes, but... It <laughs> <laughs> but he said that if he doesn't pay the hospital bill, that they will drag them to the police or whatever. And I told him, I said, this child gave you nine solid month notice. So after nine months, you cannot get a hospital bill. Then you don't deserve to be a husband. You don't deserve to be a father. What am I talking about? Planlessness. Too many times, we don't apply the principles, the basic principles of life, putting first things first. And when you fail to put first things first, you are bound to get into trouble all the time. And we accuse the poor devil of being the architect of our mistakes, of our planlessness. As children of God, we got to be wise as serpents and gentle as what? As doves. It is very important that we get to know the promises of God, the principles underlining those promises and apply them in whatever we are doing. Too many times you notice that we pray and pray and pray and pray. There is nothing wrong with prayer because it says seek you first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. But after you have prayed you must put your hands to work. God does not bless your prayers. I know some of you who pick up your stone now. He's preaching fallacy now. The word of God says, I will bless the works of your hands. Can you tell me one scripture where he said, I will bless your prayers. But he said, I will bless the works of your hands. To that effect, we're able to come up with a simple formula. Because I know that you guys are, you like formulas. When you pray, and you plan, and you prepare, you will succeed in life. Young ones, I want you to take note of that formula. Prayer plus planning plus preparation is equal to prosperity. Can you take note of that? Prayer plus planning plus preparation is equal to prosperity. Prosperity, I'm not talking about financial prosperity alone. I'm talking about prospering in everything you set out to do. In whatever you want to do in life, first of all, you pray for God's guidance. Number two, you pray, then you plan in line with his revealed will consigning that particular thing that you want to do. Number three, you begin to prepare. Everything has its first step. Tell your neighbor, everything has step one. So you need to find out the step one of what you want to do. And begin to, and step one is always the easiest. It might be insignificant, but too many times we look at the last step. And when you look at the last step, you are bound to get overwhelmed. 
If I want to build a 20-story building now, and I'm looking at that 20-story, I would say, ah, this project is not for this world. But what is the step one? Is to get the land. You know? And maybe your father left an inheritance. The next thing you want to get a drawing and stuff like that. Those ones, they don't pose so much challenge. So the, any little thing that you can get, if it's sand that you can get, move the sand to the side and so on and so forth. You want to be a medical doctor, a lawyer, you want to have your PhD, you must start from the basics. Find out how many credits are you required. They say five credits, fine, you walk towards it in English and math. You start picking the necessary books, going for the necessary lessons. Little by little, you begin to build. Because anything that God does has an element of growth in it. But with the microwave mentality of our generation, nobody wants to pay the price of time that is involved in accomplishing anything that is meaningful. We want it today, today, today. Common sense will tell you, for you to have a child, it takes a minimum of nine months. There is no other way. Any other way you try to do it is going to cost you more pains. Nine solid months. Everything has its own gestation period. For you to succeed in life, whatsoever it is that you want to put your hands into, Find out the step one in it. Begin to prepare and assemble your materials. I call the preparation stage the David's ideology. You remember what happened to David? He wanted to build the temple of the Lord. And God said, my son, you cannot do that because your hand has touched so much blood. He said, Lord, fine. Even if I will not build a temple for you, let me assemble the materials that is required. And he did so. He assembled all the materials. By the time Solomon, his son, came on stage, all the materials were on ground for him to be able to carry out that assignment. Did Solomon succeed in carrying out the assignment of building the temple for the Lord? He did, but somebody prepared it for him. So when you see people succeeding without suffering, somebody must have suffered in the past for them. There is no two ways about it. You must face that stage of preparation in life. I remember in those all good years, why marriages succeed in those years. Before a girl is given out for marriage, she goes for training in another elderly family for maybe two or three years, depending on how good that girl is. Some spend almost five years, because until the madam of the house says that this girl is now matured enough to live in a man's house, nobody will give you out in marriage. And that made it possible for our homes to be successful. These days, nobody does it. Everybody, all we're interested in is sending the children to school. And even when we send them to school, we'll pack it up with lesson teachers because we're never home. From morning till night, there is nobody supervising what is happening to these children. You see a lot of young girls, they don't even know how to lit up the stove. They can't even cook anything. Because you have the maids, they are preparing the food. Their own is just to go to the dining. They know how to use their fork and knife, that's all. Then tomorrow you give out the girl a marriage. After the honeymoon, fine, you spend the honeymoon in the hotel. 
you cannot stay in the moon forever. You have to come back to your husband's house. And in the morning they wake up, the man is yawning, expecting his breakfast, and the girl is yawning too. You say, honey, what are we going to eat? He say, ah, anything now. Uh, let's go back to Sharatin. He said, we shall. Sharatin for what? That there is rice and beans in the kitchen. He said, which one? Then, of course, you might go and prepare the soup like I did the first soup that I prepared. When the thing was not sweet, I carried sugar and poured inside it. The whole thing would turn into black. <laughs> and in those days, for a man to be qualified to marry, they will give you a sheep for you to train. If you don't kill that sheep before it's time, they will know that you're matured enough now to marry. Because you know, sheep and goats are very, they are very stubborn and useless. So they give you that, and you wouldn't know that your daddy is watching how you're treating that sheep. At the end of the day, you come and say, hey, daddy, I'm ready now. You say, I'm sorry, you're not ready. You wouldn't know the yastic that has been watching how you're treating that animal. Any little thing you carry stick, mm, you stupid sheep. Your dad is watching you. Because he knows likewise, any little mistake by your wife, you're going to use hand to kill that woman. Now nobody does it. By the second day of marriage, the man turns the wife into a punching bag. Just like my cousin came early in the morning after the traditional marriage, very early in the morning, five in the morning or 5.30, knocking at the gate. I ran to the gate. I saw him. He said, abomination, abomination in Igbo. He said, alo eme, alo eme. I said, what he said, where is daddy? Where is daddy? Abomination, abomination. I said, ah. So I took him. My dad came out. Uh, what is the problem? Oh, that my wife must go. My dad said, what happened? Oh, he insulted my senior sister. He must go, this and that. That this is abomination. <coughs> my dad looked at him. He said, number one, if you say something is abomination, it becomes abomination. Go and tell your senior sister that before I get to your company, you should go back to the husband's house. Said the wife who just brought yesterday, you say he's going this morning. Who is doing that? Are you hearing me? Because an elder was home. If it were just maybe me and him and the other young people, we say, yes, the girl will go. Are you hearing me? We need to learn some of these principles. We, how to run our homes, that's where I'm going. A home is not something you run by chance. You run the home based on the principles embedded in the Word of God. And Galatians 5, 22 and 23 is the bedrock, is the solid foundation upon which any home could be run. Without joy, you cannot run any home. I told you guys, I'm not good at laughing and smiling because as far as I'm concerned, the world is not too funny. But now I've learnt it because my wife and children, every time, I'll just go to one corner and be wondering what is making these people talking and laughing at like this. I noticed that I was the only one tensed up for nothing. Now I've learned to join them. Whether it's funny or not, me too, I will laugh. And it's helping me. You can see I'm getting younger. Amen? Amen? Because it takes 39 nerves for you to frown. And only 7 nerves for you to smile. Why should I be exercising 39 nerves? I'm suffering myself. So when somebody says, ah, you're looking 90 when I'm just 60. So, but you can see now, if they tell you that I'm 61, will you believe it? Because I've learned now to smile. They said the joy of the Lord is your strength. That joy, 
that confidence that helps you to come to terms that no matter what you're facing is temporary because God said I will not allow any trial to overwhelm you it's a promise I'm holding on to it whether the problem is from the wicked I don't care because God said the rod of the wicked will never rest upon my lot I know that promise and I'm holding on to it whether it's from the devil I don't bloody care because God said I'll work everything to cooperate and work for your good I will work it out that's the promise talk about peace he said seek it and pursue it why because when peace eludes you confusion and strife takes over many of the pimples you see on your face has nothing to do with the food you eat it has to do with the absence of the peace of mind when your heart is troubled oh it affects every organ in your system but when you learn to be at peace with your creator and with yourself oh what joy that will flood your heart what of patience a lot of young people are into the mess they are into because of impatience oh i want to marry this guy your parents said hold it let's pray about it let's make the necessary inquiries you're talking your own no? before you know it she's pregnant this is the guy i want 18 months later you ask of the guy no more sobu that has little problem do you know what it means he's gone abroad he's in the prison there last week they educated one of them that has the best hotel in Anambra State Oka he carried cocaine 158 kilograms of cocaine they caught him was it in Singapore or wherever they killed him last week because there there is no guy begging it you need to see the massive hotel with that kind of hotel what else are you looking for meanwhile he's not married he doesn't have any children impatience grab 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 we are so keen on where we want to go that we don't even have time to enjoy the little that God has given to us but when you cultivate the seed of patience in your life you know that it's just a matter of time that everything is going to be all right why there is a promise God said I will never withhold any good thing from those that love and serve me I'm a living testimony in 1985 when I went to the US for the first time I went for the Kennehagen ministry convention annual convention they call it camp meeting and prophecies all over they were prophesying how rich I was going to be how I'll be part of the end time financiers of the gospel and stuff like that boy I said in these two weeks I was now planning how to move the dollars back home <laughs> because then this same president was the military head of state and I think then you can't go with more than two hundred dollars and you can't come back home with more than one suitcase or two suitcases I, I can't remember now so I was now thinking the big suitcase I used to carry all the dollars and stuff like that <laughs> one week to the end of the camp meeting nothing nothing I got restless two days to the end nothing nothing 
the fifty dollars I had, I had to go and buy Kenneth Hagin's uh, Bible. That one they, they were selling. I think twenty nine dollars ninety nine cents. So almost thirty dollars gone out of the fifty dollars. Then the remaining one, I bought some of his new books, and I did my hand like this. I surrender. When I was coming back, you can imagine the state I was in inside that plane. All the prophets is nothing, the money nothing. Little did I know that I have to walk and walk and walk and walk up to this point. Yesterday I was sharing with my wife, I said, I'm believing in the next five years we will be truly free from all this, all this work. 1985 now how many years but I tell you something I've never lacked in any good thing and if I should take it from what I'm seeing now I'm sure that in that next five years we'll be able to be a major financer of the gospel but I thought it was going to happen <laughs> 1985 God will take you through a process. If the money now comes in in that quantum and volume now, is it going to enter my head? The answer is no. Because what am I going to do with it? Absolutely nothing. The children are all trained. They are all doing well. So, you find out that the only reasonable thing to do with that money is to put it and bringing up people in the fear and admonition of the Lord. We got to be patient with the Lord. He's working out everything for our own good. And do you know the good news? The devil cannot stop it. Why? He says, what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that love means that he has provided everything that we need in life. In Ephesians, I think 1, 3, he said God had provided everything that pertains to life and godliness. Every blessing that we need, God had provided it. He said, so what can separate us? Absolutely nothing. Why can't we be patient? and walk with him so that we can get the best. Then you talk about kindness. He said we should be kind to one another. There is no way you, uh, you cultivate that seed of kindness. What you're going to reap is kindness. You can't be kind even when people choose to be callous. They will say this one is an exception. Am I right? The same thing with goodness. The same thing with faithfulness. What am I saying? When we cultivate this fruit in our homes, in our individual lives, it's going to propel us into God's destiny for our lives. The Bible says, who can find a faithful worker? Tell me of any person that you know that is faithful and diligent in his work, that is retired, or that the employer sends away just like that, is difficult. They will always look for a way to bring you in and keep you and maintain you. He said, who can find a faithful worker? But too many times, in our quest to grab, we tend to become unfaithful. And if you are not faithful with the little things that God had given you opportunity to take care of, he says, even the one that belongs to you, God will not give to you. You know why? Because God will always use what belongs to somebody else to train you. He uses what belongs to somebody else to train you in the habit of being faithful. And if you're not faithful with little things, you can never be faithful with big things.
after you read the parable of, of the talents, one was given 5,000, the other one was given 2,000, the other one was given 1,000. Have you ever asked yourself, why did the master distribute the money like that? He had already seen the attitude towards things. And at the end of the day, he proved himself correct. The one that was given the least shows that he's just a useless servant. Rather than invest it, what did he do? He went and buried it, said, I know you're a wicked master. You always reap where you did not sow. So take back your, your money. What of being gentle? No matter the situation you find yourself in life, there are people that are still looking on to you. True or false? There are situations you will be in. You'll be thinking, oh, God is so unkind to me. Oh, oh, that. You won't even know that many people are envying the position that you are in. How do you treat such people that are looking onto you? Do you maltreat them? Do you treat them shabbily? Do you oppress them? Are you arrogant towards them? Because gentleness is strength under control. You have all the ability to do somebody in, but you choose otherwise. These are some of the fruits that when you cultivate in your life, there is no challenge that you will not be able to surmount. There is no situation that you will not be able to handle. What of that of self-control? Any little provocation, you open your mouth, volcano will just erupt. You say abominable things. Then at the end of the day, you come back to say you're sorry. Will you be able to withdraw those things? You've already caused the damage and destruction. But self-control demands that you hold back some things and allow time to work out things for you. Don't always put your mouth into gear before your head begins to think. I say it especially to women, too many times, oh, you type words, oh, before you start thinking, you're already talking. Try to hold back. Try to reflect. As a child of God, you must cultivate the habit of holding back. He said, be a good listener. Be a slow talker. When you see somebody that talks too much, a talkative will always run into trouble. And a talkative can never be trusted. So these are some of the things that we are going to develop in the weeks ahead. That's why I said it's even good to sit down in a family setting so that we can rub minds on this. Okay? They are not issues that you preach. There are issues that we must reason together and understand them and ask questions as it pertains to individual circumstances. Then we address it so that we can inculcate this lifestyle into our lives. I told you guys that we have three pillars on which we have built our family. The first one it's leading a quiet life. The second one is minding our business. The third one is working with our hands. In all circumstances that we are faced, we have tried as much as possible to lead a very quiet life. Any other family ordinarily by now must have slaughtered at least two cows because she has just turned 50. We will invite the whole world. And it's not that we don't have the means to do it, if we choose to. But guess what? Have you realized that too many times after such great parties, trouble will strike? They will say it was after. I, I can tell you of one that died last year. 
after she celebrated her 50th birthday. She celebrated it in March. She died in April. I'm telling you life story. She celebrated her 50th birthday in March and died in April. I'm not saying that there is anything wrong in celebrating. But you see, if you want to walk by God's principle, you said lead a quiet life. We've led a quiet life all throughout. We brought up the kids not throwing birthday parties up and down. Whatever our cooking utensils for our normal family cooking, that is what we use on the bad day. That's the pot. We we'll use it to cook the rice. And as the Lord leads us, we'll call one or two people that are around to come and eat. We don't invite any special caterer to come or whatever to come and cook any jazz. And the best we do is to make sure that we get a professional photographer. Like this evening, I'll take her to Studio 24 to go and take her picture. To take the picture so that you see when you're 50. That's all. Because too many times, we on our own open the door for the enemy to come in. We give unnecessary opportunity for things to be deposited into our lives. And at the end of the day, we'll turn around and begin to pray. Because we did not heed God's word, lead a quiet life. The opposite of a quiet life is a wild life. Walk about your leg. You can't sit down one place. You're always on the move. Why wouldn't you attract trouble? Because when you see walk about, you find out that you're operating in the devil's ministry. Because he walks to and fro. The devil is always on the move. And you too, you're also always on the move. God said, lead a quiet life. He didn't stop there. He also said, mind your business. Many times we are busy body. Have you heard? They said that many people have lost their lives for saying the wrong thing. Just very few people that will take kindly to gossip. When you gossip with them, they will go out of their way to make sure that they destroy you. Let's try to lead a quiet life. Let's try to walk with our hands. Anything we can lay our hands on, let's get hold of it. Why? Because God said, I will bless the works of your hands. Instead of gallivanting and moving up and down, busybodying and gallivanting and wasting all the time talking, put your hands to work and see what God will do for you. He said we should never despise little beginnings. Can we all stand? Father, we thank you. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. You can join us in worship every Sunday by 9 a.m. for World Feast. Venue is at the 7 Option Park, Ladoke Akintola Boulevard, opposite Caribou Hotel, Gerki Abuja. God bless you.